Well, I believe God does want you and me. Amen. Good morning. Isaac had asked me to preach this morning anyway because he thought he might be a little tired getting back, but they're not back. If anyone doesn't know, they got <coughs> tangled up with a little bit more than they bargained for uh, in Arkansas. Being Isaac's dad, I don't find that surprising. <laughs> so <coughs> we shall move on. Uh, I'm supposed to say that there's not going to be any um, children's choir, youth choir, whatever you want to call it, this afternoon. All right. So let's take the Word of God this morning, if we can, and I would invite your attention to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 48. Isaiah, chapter number 48. If you would like, you can stand, and we'll read a few verses of Scripture together. We're going to read the first 12 verses. <clears throat> the book of Isaiah, chapter number 48. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. For they call themselves of the holy city, and stay themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it? I have showed thee new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. They are created now and not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heardest them not, lest thou shouldest say, Behold, I knew them. Yea, thou heardest not. Yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from that time thine ear, that thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. Father, we pray that you'd be with us for a few minutes this morning as we attempt to expose this scripture and attempt to provide some things that you have given to us and things that we should earnestly seek and believe. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today with all that's going on in the world and with all the uncertainty and with all the hazards. We pray, Lord, that you would just calm us this morning that we might be able to serve you and we might be able to listen to your word. Thank you for all of your blessings on your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. When we read scriptures about being chosen, uh, we do our very best to make sure, if we can, that we are the ones that are doing the choosing. We like to be in charge. If something's going to be chosen, I will choose it. Thank you very much. God, however, is not exactly like that. We... Uh, we see the word chosen used about 123 times in Scripture. And usually, when we see that happen, it is God doing the choosing. 
choosing. In fact, you may remember Cora discovered that fact in a rather profound way when he decided that he was chosen instead of Moses and Aaron. Didn't work out too well for him. Uh, I suggest you might go and read that and look at, the, look at the passages of Scripture. The earth swallowed them up. So we do our best, even in salvation, we do our best to make salvation of our own choosing, and it is we who choose God, even though Scripture plainly tells us that we are to love Him because what? Because He first loved us. Though there is nothing in us to love, there's nothing worthy of love, and in fact, we can't really know love without Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. We find that God chose Abraham, David, Moses, Jacob. They all had brothers. But the brothers didn't get chosen. Have you ever been to an animal shelter? Um, to choose a pet? And you go into the animal shelter, and there's all kinds of pets there. Now, if you go down on the doggy side, so here's what normally happens. All the little doggies stand up, state attention. They come out to the front of the cage. They lick the cage. They wag their tails. Take me, take me, I want to go. But if you go down the kitty side, <laughs> the kitties all go to the back of the cage and hiss at you. That's why dogs get adopted more often than kittens. We did that once in Maryland, and we went and got a, uh, went to the shelter and picked out a kitty. Um, and that kitty spent the next two years of her life trying to convince us that she certainly had not chosen us. <laughs> and therefore, it must be our fault for choosing her. So we find in this rather long descriptive narrative that we read that would seem to have on the surface of it very little to do with salvation in general or what we call in the theological words world soteriology that God makes a point of telling us that it is he that does the choosing and the declaring and the knowing and the creating and the refining and God reminds us that he made a covenant with the son and his people you and I if we are children of God are simply a byproduct of that covenant. And yes, we can find a lot of things in Scripture to make us feel small and unworthy. We detest most of them. But Jesus still said in John 6, 37, that all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. So we're going to look at a couple of things this morning to make ourselves feel good. So I should note, if I wanted to preach this message and I had it already, I could use any number of scriptures to do that. I could go to Daniel chapter 3, talk about the lion's den, or I could go to Acts chapter 7 and talk about Stephen, or 1 Kings 22, talk about Ahab, 2 Kings 25, talk about Nebuchadnezzar. You could take your pick. But this is the scripture that... Uh, I believe the Lord chose for us this morning, and we're going to talk about the furnace of affliction. I should stay, say before I start that uh, not everyone in the furnace of affliction is chosen, because we're talking about the human race here. And left to itself, the human race will put itself in its very own place of affliction. Just look at what's going on in the world today. There's a lot of people today in a lot of pain, in a lot of suffering, in a lot of affliction. Yes, the most obvious place that we see it right now, today, is in Ukraine, but there are other places in the world where similar things are going on. 
So whenever we want to see someone afflicted, we can always find someone afflicted. But just finding someone afflicted does not necessarily mean that they are one of God's chosen. That's not what the Lord is telling us here. There are a lot of people who put themselves in the place of affliction. And we are not allowed to claim any righteousness just because we are afflicted. Because many times, and most times probably, we put ourselves there, right? And then we want to feel sorry for ourselves and say, Oh, Lord, I'm being afflicted. I must be one of your children. No, you must be human. Because that's what humans do. Trouble doesn't make us a child of the king. Trouble makes us human. So the chosen by this scripture that we see here are not actually put in the furnace of affliction by God until they are chosen. Until there is a relationship. But what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes this morning is the fact that if you have a relationship with God, that does not make you immune from the furnace. In fact, if you have a relationship with God, God says that he is going to refine that relationship. He is going to make something of you. He is going to do something in your life. And in a lot of situations and a lot of times, that's going to mean affliction. Because when are you closer to God? When you're on top of the mountain, everything's going well, and people are sending you lots of money? Or, or when you're in the furnace? When do you pray more? You pray more when you need to, right? When things are on your heart. When things are bothering you. When people you love are in dire circumstances. And so we've had, I, I had a brother-in-law and a 50-year friend pass away a week ago. And so there's lots of people hurting. I'm sure your family is not exempt. Miss Lisa just got back from kind of the same thing. And from time to time, we're going to go through those things because we are human. But it's best to go through those things with the Lord. Amen. Because we know we're going to go through them anyway. How many people here believe that the Lord was actually watching over you before you were saved? If you're saved this morning, if you're on your way to heaven this morning, do you believe that somehow the Lord preserved you yeah. along the way until you were saved? Amen. Amen? Yeah, because you know why? Because all of us can think back to all of the stupid stuff we did and wonder why in the world we could still be here. I mean, there's a number of times when I just could have not come back, you know. Brink of death episodes. And yet, for some reason, we're still here. You may be here this morning and not a child of God, and maybe God has brought you all the way along to here yes. so that you could get something that you need. Amen. And you need Christ. That's right. Amen. You need Christ. So the chosen here are put in the furnace by God, and they're put here being chosen. So God preserved us through all of our Stupidity, And by the way, he still does that. Yes, Amen. We don't necessarily lose all of our stupidity just because we gain the Holy Spirit. The potter still makes the vessels. And he does with them, Scripture says, what he will. Amen. And he makes one to honor and one to dishonor. Makes all of those things and... And that we claim that our will is free. You know, our free will is only God letting us think that we're making a decision. Because who decides all the circumstances that require the decision? The Lord does. Right? 
He puts us in all of the circumstances that are going to require a decision. But if you wish to find God's people, having said that just because you're in the furnace doesn't mean you're a child of God, if you wish to find God's people, you can look in the furnace. And you will find them there. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 2. We spent a year and a half studying Ecclesiastes. You should have this memorized. It says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. And the living, those of us who are still alive, will lay it to his heart. We will understand that there are going to be times like that. We can look through history, look through the Old Testament, and we can find people that were scorned, and people that were tried, and people that were tested. We can look at Abel. Abel was the righteous one, remember. What happened to him? He was killed. By his loving brother, who was upset that he wasn't the chosen. That his gift wasn't accepted and somebody else's was. We could look at Noah. Noah spent 120 years in his backyard building a box that would float with all of his neighbors, no doubt, and friends ostracizing him. What is this for? Whatever it's for, it's never going to work. Nobody wants to live there. Nobody wants to even go in there. And Noah would say, just wait. Just wait. Because there's coming a day when you're going to wish that you were in that box. Why? Because God said there's going to be a flood. Flood? That word is not even in our dictionary. Flood. They'd never had a flood. They didn't know what that was. But they were going to find out what it was. Abraham. Abraham was called out from the middle of his family, out of Ur of the Chaldees, and sent to a land that he didn't know anything about. And God said, I'm going to give you this land. And Abraham took that by promise. And as Josh sang this morning, Abraham went through the fire. Abraham was in the furnace. Abraham was tested. What about Jacob? Jacob lived basically his whole life in fear of his brother. But he was the chosen. And what about Moses? Moses had no desire to go back to Egypt. Have you ever said something like, if God were to burn a bush and tell me to do that, I wouldn't do it. Don't be so quick. <laughs> because that's happened. And God said, I'm going to send you into Egypt. I don't want to go to Egypt. I don't care. You're going to go to Egypt. I can't speak. You're speaking now. And your brother can speak. And I'm going to send your brother along with you. Whether you get along or not, it's not a problem. But you're going to go and deliver my people, Israel. Not what Moses wanted to do. Most leadership really is not willing, you know. It's just manufactured because you have to. And that's how it's done. So these were men that were scorned and were put through the furnace and but they were God's men. How many martyrs have we seen down through the years? This opens somehow. There we go. How many martyrs have we seen down through the years? People who have given their lives for their faith, for the cause of Christ. How many people hiding out from the Inquisition in Europe? How many, how many believers in this country that were persecuted? And yet we know a lot of their names. 
Roger Williams, John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, Isaac Backus, Joel Osteen. Oh, well, no, forget the last one. <laughs> that would never happen to Joel Osteen. And yet, they were all tried in the furnace. Why? For their service to their God. All the apostles, we look at the apostles and say, oh boy, I sure would like to be an apostle. All the apostles died except maybe John. Their lives were taken from them for their service to God. They died in the furnace. And we think somehow that we're going to escape one. Because we're such a friend of God. Or because we do such great things for the Lord. Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. So you can pretty much mark it down. If you're going to be a friend of Jesus, somebody's not going to like that. Not going to like that. So the obvious question is, why do these things happen? Does, does God not love his people? Doesn't he care for his own? Is he not up there watching over us? Does he save us just to persecute us? Doesn't he want us to have the finest things? Yes, he does. Let me ask you a question. Where are the finest things? Amen. They're not here. They're not here. The finest things are in heaven, and we're supposed to be laying our treasures up there. Amen? And when you get there, if you've laid up treasures there, you will have them. Moth and rust doesn't corrupt. Thieves don't break through and steal. All the things that we do for Christ are still there. They're still going to be there. All of that stuff that we wasted down here on our own desires and all of the things that we decided that we wanted to do because we have the will to do it, all going to burn up. All going to burn up. That's where the finest things are. Turn back just a minute to the book of Genesis, chapter number 15. I want to see how God settled a covenant one time. Genesis chapter 15. Verse number 1 says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. And when we get down to verse number 12, it says, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Chosen of God. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. This is God promising Abraham that this promised seed that he has given to him is going to be afflicted for 400 years. 400 years is a long time longer than you and I will live. <coughs> it's longer than our country has been in existence. And yet God promised Abraham that because he was chosen, your offspring are going to serve and be afflicted for 400 years. And also, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What's God saying I'll tell you exactly what he's saying. He's saying, Abraham, you're secure, but this is not about you. 
sometimes we get to thinking, you know, that it's it's really all about us. God's going to do this. God's going to use me to do that. You know, listen, the Lord will use do with you what He pleases. There are a lot of people here that were afflicted for 400 years whose names we don't even know. And guess what? There's a lot afflicted today whose names we don't know. And at some point in time, should the Lord decide to try us, some of us may be there and may be afflicted. Thank the Lord it probably won't be for 400 years. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a what? A smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. What was he doing? Sacrifice. Burned offering. Who did it? God did it. Why? To show Abram a covenant a covenant relationship in the furnace in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river the river Euphrates the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Huttites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites I'm giving you all of those but you're going to spend some time in the furnace it's a sign of my covenant. God loves his people. But they may be purified. In the furnace. Abraham was. What makes you and I better than Abraham? Moses was. What makes you and I better than Moses? We got this idea today. That if we just accept Christ. Everything ought to be a bed of roses. From here on out. No, this, is, this earth is not where you should look for for your bed of roses. There will be rest. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. But for right now, for this red hot minute, we're not actually promised ease in Zion. A covenant. Purified in the furnace. Proved in the furnace. Passed between the pieces. Burned up. Privileged in the furnace. With the presence of God. See, here's the difference. Between you and other, any other human being wandering on the face of the earth that's managed to create a crisis for himself. When we manage to create a crisis for ourselves... There is someone that we can go to. Amen. We have a Savior. Amen. Who is, as the angel said, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. That says a lot right there. And so, understand. If you are a child of God, you will probably go through the furnace. But God will be there with you. And there is great comfort in the furnace when God is there. The three Hebrew children went into the furnace and didn't even get burned. Right? Why? Because the presence of God was there. Amen. Even the king saw it. He said, didn't we throw three people in there? Yeah, three people. Well, how come I see four? Yeah. Well, you see four because God went to the furnace. Amen. And God can come to your furnace as well. Amen. No, he may not take the furnace away, but he may get you through the furnace. And when your time comes to leave the furnace, he may just take you on home. And you won't have to worry about a furnace 
ever again. The covenant in the furnace. By the way, the world is going to end how? By fire. It's going to be burned up. Better get ready. Every precious thing has to be tried. Gold and silver come from ore. It's refined. It has to be mined. It has to be purified. Most sacrifices are burned with fire in the Old Testament. Burning incense represents prayer of the saints. But you're not alone in the furnace. Because the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. It's not something that we have to wait for. It's already there. And he's going to be with us through the fire. In a former life, I was a Coast Guard Marine Safety Inspector. 100 years ago or so. And um, as a Coast Guard Marine Safety Inspector, when you walked in to a shipyard or onto a ship, or they called you sir, they wanted to make sure that your every wish was taken care of because you had their future in your hands. And there's this little thing called a certificate of inspection. And if you don't like it, what, see, what you're seeing, you just go up to the bridge and you say, I'm taking this. And they can't go anywhere. Because they have to have that in order to operate. So I spent about a year, year and a half at Bethlehem Steel in uh, Sparrows Point, Maryland. And uh, I, think that, I think that whole place is shut down now. See, the United States doesn't do anything anymore. We buy it from everybody else. But when I was there, we were building 150,000 ton super tankers. And they, built, and they made their own steel. That's why there was called Bethlehem Steel. I don't know if steel is still made anywhere in this country, but it was made there. And we could go over and see how it was made. It's pretty impressive. They bring railroad cars in with all of that ore on it. It just looks like a bunch of junk. And then they roll it up onto this thing and they dump it into these cauldrons about the size of this room and about 30 feet deep, and they heat it. I mean, they don't just heat it, they heat it. And it turns to liquid, everything in there turns to liquid, and they draw off all of those impurities from the top and they heat it some more, and they draw off impurities from the top and they heat it some more, and it turns yellow and it turns red and it turns white. You say, man, I'm glad I'm an inspector because I don't want to work here. And it's about like 500 degrees in there. And these, they take these big vats about the size of this room. And after that steel is all done and all purified and all made, they take these huge things and they roll it and they pour it out. And it goes out into a big mold that makes, in this case, probably three quarter inch steel plate and they take that three quarter inch steel plate and they weld it together and they make a ship out of it that can withstand all the storms that the sea wants to provide and that's how they do it and it's hot the Bible says we're supposed to prevent present our bodies a living sacrifice living sacrifice sacrifices go through the fire in order to be appreciated by God and he sees the sacrifice and says I will accept that sacrifice but not from a human being I will only accept that sacrifice from my son with whom I made the covenant that he would go and die on a cross 
so that all of this dross and, and wherewithal and stuff that was poured out can be used. And I'm going to refine them in the fire. So it should come as no surprise to you and I that we have some little things perhaps go wrong in our life or what we would consider going wrong. Because we don't really deserve anything greater than that, right? And the Lord has promised that he's going to refine us. James 1.3 says the trying of your faith worketh patience and to count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations. Amen! We love it, right? Bring it on. It's joyful. That's not usually how we deal with it. We deal with it with tears and with agony. And we're saying that God doesn't love us anymore and wanting our mommy. <laughs> Got news for you. Your mommy is not going to do you any good when it comes to dealing with the Lord. Amen. You're responsible for that. Right. You're responsible for that. Need some comfort in the furnace? Well, he's chosen you chosen you. There should be some comfort in that. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But isn't that exactly what we feel like? Lord, this ain't supposed to happen. Why is this going on? Why should I have to deal with this? No, it's not some strange thing. He says what? But rejoice. I think Peter knew a little bit about that, don't you? He did deny the Lord three times. But you know what? The Lord forgave him. And then put him through the fire. So he could be purified. So he could be protected. He's chosen you. Why? To bring forth his glory. Rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Listen, no matter what you and I go through, it will not be anywhere near what Christ went through. Right. And why did he do that? He did it for us did it for us that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy so we may have our problems down here but when his glory is revealed you want to be in a place where you can be glad about it Amen. and that's what he's saying child of God you can be glad about it because when Christ comes back when he appears, you're going to think that all those trials you went through, piece of cake. Right? Nothing to it. Stay close to him. Amen. I would be remiss if I did not remind you that there is one furnace that you do not want to encounter. Right. It will contain all the filth of the world. All those who will not consent to be governed by Christ will be there. Their will has sent them there. Their intentions have sent them there. There is no escape from there. There is eternal torment there. The devil and his angels will be there. You can call it by any number of names, Gehenna, Hell, Hades, but all of that's going to be tossed into the lake of fire and be burned up. That's where the lost angels are going to be. 
That's where the lost humans are going to be. That's where all of those who have not trusted Christ, received Christ, scriptural terminology, that's where they're going to be. You don't want to be there. There's eternal torment there. But if you turn to Christ, you don't have to go there. And I don't think it's wrong to warn people of what's going to happen if they don't turn to Christ. Because that is what will happen. Every soul who has ever died, saved or lost, would tell you to do anything you can do to avoid going there. All of them. There's some big graveyards around New York. I used to drive by the cemeteries. There's just thousands of people, thousands of headstones. And you know, all of those people that are there, they're somewhere. There's no atheists there. They all know. And if they could come back here for just five seconds, whether they were saved or they were lost, they would tell you. Don't go there. You don't have to go there. Christ went to the cross and paid that penalty, so you don't have to go there. Well, what do I have to do then? What you have to do is just sit down and surrender. Amen. That's all. That's all. Just sit down and surrender. Say, Lord, it's all yours. I can't do anything. I can just take myself from one fire to the next fire. This is not doing any good. (laughs) Who can get you out of the fire? The Lord can. The one who paid the penalty. The one who's going to stand before Christ when the sheep are counted and say, Lord, that one is mine. That one's mine. Is he guilty? He ought to be guilty, but he's not guilty. Because I paid the penalty. Has he been through some fire? Yes, he's been through some fire of his own making. And he's been sort of through some fire of our making. But he's purified. And he's mine. Amen. Amen. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all we have to do. Turn to Christ. Repent of your sin. Ask Christ for salvation. Choose wisely. Because the choice is yours. The choice is yours. Let's all stand. Ms. Wael, you come. Brother Adam, come have a verse of invitation. We're either going to be delivered delivered from the fire or we're going to spend eternity in it. It'll be one of those things for everybody. No matter what their station in life, no matter how important or unimportant they were here, no matter if they went to a big church or a little church, or if they had thousands of people following them on Facebook, It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your relationship to Christ. That's what matters. And if you don't have one, you need one. And there is nothing preventing you from getting one today except yourself. Amen? What number are we going to?